Hello, and welcome to Banking Transform, the top podcast in retail banking. I'm your host, Jim Maroos, owner and CEO of the Digital Bank Report and co-publisher of the financial brand. Credit cards are one of the primary foundations for credit relationships at almost every financial institution, accounting for 37% of consumer purchases by dollar value in 2021. But the marketplace is changing as usage patterns evolve due to economic conditions and new credit alternatives. To continue to grow credit card relationships and relationships in general, banks and credit unions must reimagine their products to meet consumer needs using deeper data insights to reach specific segments, drive engagement, and to rethink card economics. Today, we have Josh Turnbull and Craig LaChapelle from TransUnion on the Bank and Transform podcast. They'll share the current state of the credit card marketplace and how financial institutions can better prepare for the credit consumer of the future. Credit cards continue to be one of the best performing businesses in financial services with a return on assets of 3.6% in 2020, according to McKinsey. Credit cards are also the primary method of unsecured borrowing for U.S. consumers, accounting for 78% of balances when transaction volumes continually have year-over-year growth. However, financial institutions face circumstances that make profitable growth harder to sustain, from increased competition to greater losses from fraud and economic hardships. So, Josh and Craig, what is the current state of credit card marketplace today? Hey, Jim, this is Craig. Uh, thanks for having us on. Yeah. Let, me, let me jump at this one. So we like to th- look at the health of the market, looking at really three things, originations, balances, and delinquencies. It, it also helps that a lot our customers tend to look at things that way as, as well. You know, at the top line, this is clearly a different year than 22, at least at the start, where, you know, in 22, we came in strong. However, the macro story right now has clearly softened. So just let's go through originations, balance, delinquency, you know, at a high level. I'm not trying not gonna belabor you with, with too many statistics here. And I'm gonna focus on bank card instead of private label just from a yep. uh, illustrative standpoint. So yep. from a card's origination standpoint, you know, 22 ended at an all-time high, coming in around the high 80 million in terms of number of new accounts. Now we forecast originations to take a step back in 23 to the low 80 millions, but you know it's well above uh, 21, and it's really back on trend if you take the disruption of the pandemic years out. Um, consumers, it right now seem to be just a bit more tepid in looking at new accounts than perhaps in the recent years, and issuers are being more judicious with marketing and underwriting. So that, that leads to the softening there. And from a balance standpoint, you know, we believe in 23 total balances, again, for bank card are going to come in above 930 billion. That's at least our forecast. Now, this is up a little less or right around a 3%. Um, you know, that's a clear softening in terms of growth rate, still positive, but clear softening versus in 22, and that was up almost uh, 20%, let's say 19%, which, you know, for context, significant reversal coming off of the deleveraging we saw in 21, and uh, excuse me, in 20 and early 21. Now, delinquency, so, sorry, go ahead. Jim. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna say, from a delinquency standpoint, again, we look at 90 days past due. We think that's gonna come in at 2.6% in 23. Now that's up year over year, probably about 20%. But, you know, from a context, we saw, saw historic lows in in 21. We believe we're, we're probably in a normal zone historically, maybe slightly elevated um, o- overall. But so overall, we think it's a slower growth market, still healthy, particularly after the, the down years of, of 20 and the disruption or the snapback, I should say, in 21 and 22. You know, so Josh, from your perspective, you know, what's interesting is that most people, lay people like myself, would think that, oh, geez, the economy situation is, is really 
stemmed mine and 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 really changed maybe the delinquency rate great, greater than we think. So really overall, the credit marketplace, given all the dynamics of the last two years, has really plugged along from a credit card perspective, correct? It has, it has, it's, it's done really well, especially the last year. Yeah, and, and from a usage perspective, what do you sense that consumers are wanting from their credit card today and from their credit card issuer? In other words, what maybe has changed over the last two years from the consumer's perspective as to what they're using their credit card for and what they want from their, their issuers? So, Jim, it's, this is Craig again. Yeah, I'd say it's a return to normal. I mentioned earlier uh, deleveraging or what we mean by that's just a fancy word for folks were paying their balances down in, in 20 and 21. They're, they're returning to, I'd say, exhibiting or following the historic value of card, both from a payments perspective as well as a, a lending perspective. That's why we saw such significant balance growth in 22 you know, monitoring it a, a, a bit in 23. Um, and, you know, from a competitive standpoint, we see the competition really, you know, continue to be quite strong for the lower risk customers. They're open to buy is at all time highs. And, you know, our, our customers, the issuers are really looking at, at product fit as a way to drive cross sales. And, and, and Josh, from the perspective of financial institutions, what are the opportunities and challenges in the marketplace today? You know, we, we touch upon them quite a bit in a broad sense, but what are, you, what are you seeing from the financial students' perspective as to what they're liking, what they may not be liking in the marketplace? Yeah, well, and, and to build on, on Craig's point too, to answer that question, Jim, I think consumers want credit. And so a, a credit card, it plays two roles. It's a convenient way to pay for things, and it gives me a line of credit if there's something I can't afford today that I might be able to pay off over time. And so you've got consumers who are back to you know historic spending habits, and you've got consumers, uh, all of us, but but that impacts some more than others, whose everyday lives are costing more, and so the the need for that credit is more important. So consumers want credit. Financial institutions still want to grow, and so I think we've we've seen this pivot from what was you know the, the last part of 21 and 22 to kind of full-on growth mode to safe growth mode and you know, one of the things that that is a market we observed early in 2020 was there are some issuers and credit card lenders who pulled back i wasn't sure what was going to happen you know the sky yeah. may be falling so I, I pulled back out of market it takes a long time to restart that machine once you've done that and so we think more than ever, our issuers understand that, that that's not what they want to do. They don't want to pull back. They want to keep going, but they want to keep going smartly. And so make adjustments to strategies. And that looks different depending on, on the type of issue you are. Certainly, we're seeing the delinquency right, rates rise um, higher in the, the non-prime zone, which is what you'd expect. And so there's been some pulling back there, but certainly not a retreat. Uh, for other customers, Craig mentioned the, the historic levels of open to buy. Uh, if you're a you know, regional bank or a, a large issuer going after super prime customers, it, things are still really good. And so they're being aggressive. And Craig mentioned the the historic number of cards that are being put out in the market. You're competing to get those balances. So people are still looking to grow, but doing it smartly. So, you know, sticking with you, Josh, for a second, you know, one of the most powerful benefits of a credit card customer is that through their purchase, you get a feel for their lifestyle, their priorities their challenges mm -hmm. through their credit data. You know, how well are financial institutions today using the insight that they get from the credit card information to address the opportunities and challenges of the consumer or to better target who they should be reaching out to? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it's hard to maybe give a grade for the industry overall. You see some who are doing better than others, and I'm sure which, which isn't surprising. Um, but one of the areas that we're really seeing people focus is trying to make smarter decisions about who you're going after and how you're going after them and, and how, you're, um, how you're growing those, those accounts. And so kind of sticking with the acquisition side uh, versus existing cards, there are all these cards being put into market. People are going after these consumers. So you've got a challenge of, of how do you stand out from the crowd? When you're trying to get someone to come on uh, to your card, 
how do you make that offer stand out? And so it's, you know, whether it's data that you have from on that consumer from an existing checking relationship or some other type of relationship, or if they're a prospect, you know, how do you use those data to demonstrate to that consumer that you understand them, you understand their needs and make sure you've matched the offer to that, that consumer. And and you spend a lot of time talking about this issue on your podcast and and in your writing, but um, it's critical. Yeah, Craig, from your perspective on the same question, um, a lot of financial institutions have the data. Um, you provide a lot of tools that financial institutions can have around what their customer base looks like, both from a credit perspective, but also from an interactive, from a lifestyle perspective. What what are some of the the what are some of the most progressive institutions doing? to use data to drive usage, reduce losses, provide, you know, possibly build better relationships? Yeah, great, great question. Um, And I'll go back to something that I uh, touched on before, and that's product propensity. So these issuers have insight into their, clearly their existing base, their portfolio of, Uh, cards and customers that they serve. And they can look at trends in payment behaviors, trends in usage to not only assess risk, but also to assess whether one of their accounts or customers is at risk of leaving, a risk of attrition. So they can respond with usage offers or cross-sell offers based on what they've seen in terms of traditional spend and how that spend has has changed. Just anecdotally, uh, on this point, you know, I received a new card, another one of my cards I began to use less in specific categories. Guess what? They reacted pretty impressively and pretty quickly with a counter offer on a new type of card as well as new incentives. So you start to see more of those things uh, occurring in the market. You know, you know, it's interesting because I, I think one thing that happened with the pandemic is consumers became much, much more aware of what's possible with data and how it's being used by other organizations outside the financial industry. You know, everything from Hulu to Amazon, from Apple to, you know, virtually any retailer out there, the way they're leveraging data. So that gets us over the hurdle, I think, to a degree of the, the big brother syndrome out there. You know, Craig, from your perspective, um, are financial institutions using credit data for more than just credit relationships, going beyond a a credit card or lending portfolio to use it to maybe open new accounts on on a consumer basis or other things that are being done? Because we're seeing more and more of the big issuers do all kinds of things trying to expand the relationship relationships with their credit card base. What, what are you seeing out there? Yeah, great question. I mean, fundamentally, yeah, that it's still, they're still using credit data, whether it's traditional data or trended data. And what we mean by trended data, it's really uh, either on a risk score or the report or an attribute, the ability to see financial credit behavior over the course of two to three years, uh, instead of just a, a quick snapshot of seeing a movie instead of a still. If, if you will. So they're increasingly using this trended data in across the credit life cycle, whether it's in marketing or underwriting. So, you know, it, this time of year or this type of economy, which is softening, we're seeing a lot more sophistication in how they look at uh, existing accounts, essentially reviewing their portfolios. You know, if you go back to it, it, we saw this heightened awareness start to pop up during the pandemic, a heightened emphasis on liquidity. So banks and issuers looked at, you know, consumers in accommodation. The, uh, what is their payment uh, ability ch- or how is it changing versus minimum dues? Things of that, that nature, as well as things like increasing the frequency uh, of the actual review. So that that's from a management perspective, but maybe perhaps where you were going initially beyond uh, the underwriting perspective. If you look at, or excuse me, the account management perspective, we're seeing increasing adoption 
of trended risk scores in marketing. And it's not just about financial inclusion, that, that is a piece of it, but ultimately uh, our customers, the issuers are really trying to find more by adopting or applying a greater precision in their targeting or even in their underwriting by disaggregating traditional risk score bands. Um, and, and I think a lot of this, you know, Jim, is uh, driven by the natural evolution of wanting to better serve consumers, be able to offer, say more, say yes to more folks, but doing it in a, in a way that doesn't throw out the baby, baby with the bathwater from a, from a risk perspective. Um, one other area that we're seeing increased interest in, particularly over the, the last year or so, um, is really greater investment in business intelligent data and capabilities. And it starts with you know, issuers and banks looking at their competitive positioning and strategy by reviewing their performance versus their peers or other perhaps new entrants on an account level or a portfolio level to inform strategies and, and opportunities. And these can lead to new product ideas, new underwriting strategies, new marketing uh, campaigns, and then those product propensities, product fits that I mentioned for optimizing offers. You, you know, Josh, you know, all these ideas are, are exceptional. And because of the data we have from the credit usage, we can do a lot more. How does TransUnion basically partner with financial institutions to make them better at what they do? Yeah, well, let me let me give you two examples and places we're seeing a lot of interest, Jim. And, and Craig's uh, talked a, in the last answer. Craig mentioned a lot around the the risk decision. I think there are two other places where we're seeing institutions spend a lot of time thinking about how they use data and not just credit data, but working with you know some of the other data that we have or, or others have. Um, the, the first is fraud, and in every chart that we see or, or folks see, you see fraud returning to the financial services sector. Uh, in, in many different facets. Uh, but the the investments people are making here and, and what the focus really is, is on the experience, on the customer experience. And, and you hit on this uh, in your, your comments a couple of questions ago. And financial services firms, they, they clearly have more riding on the line than Netflix or Nordstrom. But the experiences that I have with those types of providers shape my expectations. And so you know, when I when I call my bank, having to go through multiple verification steps, um, even you know, when I go in and transfer from one account to the other internally, having to answer security questions, these are all things that make me crazy. Um, so, how do as a as a bank, how do I better use the data that I have or that I can get about a consumer, about her phone, about her behaviors, and really decrease that friction for the ninety nine percent of of good transactions, be those servicing transactions, applications, whatever they are. Um, you know, the the second piece we're seeing a lot of energy around is marketing. Um, you've again talked multiple times about the degree to which consumers reward FIs that demonstrate that they understand them. Um, the industry falls short. You know, I, I, one example of this um, I, I get as as many people listening to this podcast probably do. Um, I'm lucky to be in a position where I'm able to, to pay my credit card bills off in full every month. I put every dollar I can on my credit cards to get the, the rewards. But what that signals, if you're not looking at the data in the right way, is that I have high balances. And so I, I get a good number of offers for either you know debt consolidation loans or balance transfer offers. It's a total waste of money for, for the person sending those right. to me. And to me, it demonstrates that that's a financial institution who doesn't understand who I am and doesn't understand my needs. And so... You know, how do I better understand this person, whether they're a customer of mine or whether they're a prospect so that I can demonstrate to them that, you know, I understand them and I can engage with them in a meaningful way that's going to lead to a better outcome for the both of us. So so on that same subject, then, Josh, how is TransUnion working to build a, a bigger portfolio of insights that can help the financial institution? Because a, a lot of financial institutions don't want to make five, six, seven different relationships with data sources out there. They'd like to go to the to the traditional sources that they've used in the past. How is TransUnion looking at, I'm not going to call it alternative credit or alternative uh, 
credit bureau information, because that's really a misnomer in many senses. But how are you expanding the insights you have that you can help institutions do better at knowing what I want when I want it? Yeah, no, great question. And we, you know, we think of ourselves as, as first and foremost, it's about understanding the consumer and the consumer's identity. And so for a long time, uh, for for TransUnion or companies like us, that's been a lot around the the credit information, credit data, the credit file. And we certainly continue to make investments there. Craig mentioned some of the ways in which we're using credit data in new and innovative ways. Some of the, what I'll call, again, with that term, alternative credit data, where it's data that can be used in a risk decision and is in or adjacent to the credit file. Uh, but also massive investments in, in data around um, the whole consumer's identity. So, you know, online behaviors, device behaviors, everything that helps me understand that consumer. I'm not going to use that decision in a, a, or use that data in a credit decision, but I can use that data to, you know, whether it's in a, a risk application, whether it's in knowing kind of how I should interact with you, uh, what, what types of offers, what products best for you, what you're likely doing in market. Um, you know, so so just I think you see a, a lot of investment trying to bring all those data um, under one roof so that we're able to better serve our customers as they're really trying to break down their own silos, frankly, too, and, um, you know, have these these better views of consumers that help them serve them. You know, Craig, it's interesting because I, I was fortunate enough to go to Shenzhen, China at the beginning of 2020 and visit WeBank, and mm -hmm. they built their whole business model on trying to have almost full inclusion. And they used um, phone data, information that on how somebody's using their phone and, and different types of data that is not traditional credit data to determine who would not be a good customer from a risk standpoint. So instead of saying, who's the best customer, it's almost like looking at, okay, who are the few that we should omit from the data source, from the, the customer database, to expand, and I'm going to call it financial inclusion because we, we talk about that all the time, but the reality is it's broadening the potential marketplace out there. What is TransUnion's perspective on this data and the ability to use it? And we talk about it not as a credit scoring um, behavior, but really as an inclusionary behavior that may go beyond simply how much credit you can offer or maybe completely looking at credit in a different way where 100 or $200 lines may not be a bad business if you get the masses? Yeah, great question. I, I'd say fundamentally at TransUnion, we're looking at ways to enhance our ability to deliver insights, whether you call it the identity graph or you know risk assessment of consumers to our customers. And that drives a lot of what we do. We have a dedicated group that goes out and looks at new data sources, whether it's you know lease data, furnished data, data that we can acquire, to, to vet that data, to test it, yeah. to see and prove out that there's value or what we call lift in the data. And then we develop a strategy for what we're going to ingest and how we're going to deploy it. So that's that's the general answer without getting into specifics. It really drives who we are and how we try to deliver value to our customers. And I would just add on, Jim, if I could, on, on the yeah. inclusion standpoint, you know, there's, there's a lot of interest in and focus on new sources of data and alternative data. And those things are all really important. Um, and we've also seen Craig mentioned the trended credit scores just through using the data that's always been on the credit file differently. Yep. I mean, the, the the many of the the traditional risk scores on which a lot of institutions still rely and things they reflect kind of the the computing power and data storage costs of of thirty years ago. But by moving to those those trended scores, same same credit data that's always been there, right? But looking at it in a different way. You know, tens of millions of people that can be brought into the financial services system with a credit score, um, and and in um, you know communities that are that are underserved, and and there lots of interesting work that's been done on this. But even just being smarter about how you use the data that's already there um, and yeah. well within, you know, very familiar, um, has has huge impact. 
You know, it, it's interesting also because, you know, you provide resources to consumers directly on being able to improve their financial wellness. But we're seeing more and more financial institutions partnering with, with firms like yours to help consumers themselves. Are you seeing this as a, as a big opportunity for financial institutions to say, it's not just about driving more usage and more credits, you know, credit balances, things of this nature, but really the opposite side, which is, you know, we want you to become better stewards of your, your, your money and your credit. Um, are you seeing a lot more organizations reaching out to you to, to build that capability better? Absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things about financial inclusion is you look at, there, there isn't the same definition for, um, not every issuer defines financial inclusion the same way. Some think of it as more access, access to deposits, access to credit. It can be a variety of, of different things. But, you know, one of the things that we've been promoting and highlighting is partnering with our customers to educate the consumers better, either uh, proactively or reactively, you know, offsite, onsite. It's something, yeah. but both current customers as, as well as prospects. Because even selfishly, I, I think the fintechs have um, accelerated the visibility or escalated the visibility of the importance of consumer education and the more established uh, issuers you get to the larger banks and the larger card issuers, you know, are clearly reacting because they recognize the need, but they also recognize the threat of not providing yeah. it. Well, and and you guys are in the best business to do this too. I mean, you can you can almost make it a turnkey solution for financials because nobody, you know, if they want to build it internally, that's one thing. But you you have all the tools to be able to say, you know, if this, then that type scenario where you can identify challenges out there for a financial institution to be able to reach out to their customer base with better solutions. And it's really evolved, too. And if you, if you think about, Jim, you know, if I'm a if I'm a bank or a credit card issuer and I give you your credit score every month on your statement or I, I put that on the website where you can see it, that's a a value add for you, but it's a static display of information versus if I give you a tool where you can come and and plan a financial yeah. goal or interact with it. One, I've I've gotten you to now interact with me in a way that's not just transactional. And two, if I'm smart about it and if I have the the capability, I know a lot about you now and about what you're trying to do, about your goals, about your, you know, savings, retire, whatever it is, right, that I can use to better serve you and, and make that a deeper relationship and a longer relationship. So we're seeing a, a ton of interest in that. You know, that's that's a great point, Josh, because you mentioned that, you know, the way you use credit cards. Well, somebody can be very similar to you in the way they use credit cards. You know, they use it for everything. They pay off immediately. But it may not be because of rewards. It may just right. be the way they get paid. There's a, you know, we, we, we tend to try to combine everybody, make them look similar to somebody that we know. And it may not come out that way. And and to have that insight, to have that data and to have that interaction. And you brought it up, you know, we're we're moving, I think, as an industry from an experience perspective to an engagement perspective. How can I help you proactively? You know, I, I your credit bureaus have, have reached out to me at times based on things that have happened in my life and and said, you know, have you have you realized you can change your your credit score by doing this, which is a neat little tool. But beyond that, they also on an ongoing basis notify me when something doesn't look right in my credit bureau, when when a transaction's out of the ordinary. And and that's sometimes driven by my financial institution, but it's sometimes been driven, you know, by my credit bureau, which is an important extra benefit there and certainly solves a lot of the issues that consumers have around, geez, I need help managing my money because it's gotten more and more confusing through the years. Well, I, I think you know, to, to that point, you had a guest on recently who who was talking about this, um, you know, financial services were on this 30 day cycle. I pay my mortgage yeah. once a month. I get paid. Yeah. And, and that's the, the cycle we've for for all kinds of good reasons that we're on but to your point right if if i can interact in a, a real-time basis with you based on either signals that i see about what you might be in the market for or things that are happening right now 
now we've got an ongoing dialogue versus me communicating with you once a month on a statement or once a month in an email. Yeah, Craig, you know, from a standpoint of we keep on talking about the, the data and a lot of times financial institutions still use data to build really good reports to know me internally to the financial institution and don't do it very well to let me know as a consumer that the institution knows me. So when we talk about using credit data to build better relationships, it, it's easier said than done. What challenges do financial institutions have today in utilizing and deploying the data and the insights that you actually provide them? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. And there's <laughs> there's a variety of ways of, of answering this. I'll try to uh, touch on just a couple of dimensions. One, if we're talking about, for example, some of the trended data that's available in the market, which shows, again, gives a view of how somebody's performing over time and uh, instead of a, a snapshot, there are some legacy systems issues in terms of how to ingest that data um, from a, a score perspective. Um, you know, you got a uh, other parties in the um, ecosystem that uh, need to adjust to support that. But then you get into you're using some of those trended attributes, either for marketing or for uh, risk assessment. You, a lot of it gets down to how easy is it to change my models from a model government governance and compliance perspective. You know, the, the other area and it, it builds on some of the questions you mentioned earlier, Jim, is there is a lot of information out there. There is a lot of uh, different sources of information. And how do they how do they put in place a program to assess all that information uh, and analyze it and uh, essentially find lift? And one of the things that we're seeing um, increasingly is with the decrease in computing costs, perhaps more on the larger issuer side, them is the issuers building their own in-house, now let's consider it cloud in-house, but their own data sets where they're able with our assistance to link to a variety of different data sets to really accelerate the pace of exploration and analytics. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it, it really does. And, and, you know, when you look at that, when you look at the potential, I'm going to take this a little bit deeper and say, OK, so, Craig, you you leave your, your current employment and you go to a financial institution. What is the first thing that you would do to take the greatest advantage of what TransUnion offers you as a financial institution? and deploy it against consumers. I mean, what, you know, it, it put it a different way, if you have a recommendation for a financial institution as far as how to better utilize the relationship between their organization yeah. and TransUnion, what would you recommend? Great question. And I'm gonna stay high level and I'm gonna stay strategic. I would, if I would jump to one of our customers, one of the first things that I would suggest we do in our engagements, assuming we're not doing it already, and we are doing it for many, is set up, I'll call it market perspectives re reviews, either on a monthly or quarterly basis, where we can share um, observations, conclusions, recommendations, really to say, hey, this is what's going on. This is how you compare. There might be an opportunity here, or you know what, you're great. How do you continue to build on that? So it's establishing that advisory relationship. That's the very first thing I would do. You know, that is tremendous. I, it's funny because I used to be in the digital and direct marketing business and, and it was amazing to me how few times organizations would knock on my door and say, geez, can you come in and do a review of how we compare to others? Because you brought it up. You have a lot of case studies. You have a lot of victories. And you also have a, some defeats that say, I'd love you to avoid this. It's like the, the Google Maps of, of financial service where you go, I, I, I would, it would be in everybody's best interest to do what the winners are doing and avoid what the losers aren't, are doing. You know, and, and, you know, Josh, from your perspective, what would you recommend? Maybe it's a deeper dive in what Craig mentioned. Just go same theme, but going maybe a level deeper than Craig, I would ask, you know, how are we doing and how do you know? And and so 
whether it's whether whether things are are great from an economic standpoint or things are challenging, I know that you know my balances are up relative to last year. I know that I've gotten these cards or those cards or this is my average transaction amount and all of that. Maybe it's better than it was a year ago, but if I can't benchmark that against either my peer set yeah. or you know the people that are in the branch next door to me, um, you know how do I? how do I know in relative terms how I'm doing to the market? So I think that's that's the first thing I would ask if I took the helm of a you know, a credit card operation or any financial services operation is, you know, what, are, what are these KPIs and then how do we, it's, it's great that it's up, it's great that it's down, but but who's our peer set? Who are we comparing ourselves to? And, yep. and how are we doing relative to them? Because that's where, you know, and, until you understand that, I don't know what I want to focus on. That, you know, that's a great insight because you can think you're doing great. I mean, uh, it's interesting because we talk about in the deposit world that when the government sent out checks, everybody's getting on their high horse that, oh my gosh, my deposits went way up and, and geez, we're, we're flushed in deposits and felt really good about it. But very few organizations did an analysis of the amount of transfers out of their financial institution to other financial institution providers. And until you saw in perspective how you were doing you can get a very narrow view as to things are great, things aren't great, but but you don't have the perspective. You said the benchmarking. It just is one one very specific yeah. example of this. Recently, working with a, a, a decent sized bank, and they were benchmarking their delinquencies against a peer group, and, and feeling pretty good about that. Um, but then when we when we said, you know, but sure, those are your peers, but the, your approach to risk and your portfolio composition is a little different. So let's let's actually benchmark that against a, a like for like portfolio comparison. And it paints a very different picture, right, which tells right. you that you've got some work to do. And so I think that just really making sure that you've you've benchmarked yourself against some granular data is is so critical. Hey, one thing to add, I don't want listeners to think that we can benchmark company a versus company b when we benchmark no. it's broad no. data set no. so we're not oh yeah you know showing competitive information it's nothing like that yeah oh exactly exactly but the reality is you know it, it, the you just look at the the whole perspective of you know is the business being optimized mm -hmm. you know your 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 uh your delinquencies could be way low but you you could be far from optimizing the revenue potential of the business because you've made so many decisions in the past that have made it so that, you know, you give virtually nobody credit. Um, yeah, you can make your delinquencies go down. You can make your attrition go up, whatever you wanted to do. But it's based on, you know, what what is your portfolio look like? You know, and, and finally, there's trends out there. We, we see, you know, the marketplace changing, innovations happening. We saw buy now, pay later, um, go up, go down, you know, still uh, still out there quite a bit. What, what do you see as being, for both of you, what do you see as being some business altering trends that you may see in the future? And it may not be a prediction, it may not actually come true, but what do you see happening going forward? Uh, Josh, let's start with you. Yeah, so just a, a couple of thoughts on that, Jim. So go back to a comment I made earlier and that the credit card, it has two functions. One, it's a convenient payment vehicle for all of us. And, and two, for many folks, it's a lending product on which, which people rely. So if you think about it in those terms, on the payment vehicle standpoint, one of the things that we're paying a lot of attention to is we're seeing some of the things that used to be options for online payments only, uh, non-card options. So seeing those now appear at retail point of sale brick and mortar retail point of sale yep. and you know there there are a number of reasons for those economic convenience but but what's happening there and there's certainly some some entrants that are trying to chip away at the primacy of the the credit card in that space um absolutely something i would be paying attention to uh, that i do pay attention to but would pay paying attention to in a different lens if i was sitting at a, an issuer uh, and then you mentioned BNPL, but on the the second piece, the the fact that a credit card is a lending product, the last few years have seen an emergence of of literally hundreds of fintech lenders who you know they're working with the bank on the back end, but they have credit card programs, and and many of these are very niche programs, and they have the ability to tailor these programs or offer features or, or what have you that. Um, some of the larger players just don't have. And so I think those are those are a couple of the dynamics of um, that, that I'm paying attention to. How about you, Craig? 
Sure, and I'm going to hit on something that's very near and dear in your heart since you wrote an article about it this week, um, or at least published this week on, on AI. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity in deploying that in yeah. what I would call is connected customer interactions, whether it's you know online or you know over the phone, or at some point it's it's you know where there's true interaction, either from a customer service perspective, you know simple Q and A, or you know at what point do we get into recommendations uh, that supplied by you know something analogous to Chat GBT in terms of yeah you know managing your spend, new products. Uh, different solutions that uh, or investments that somebody uh, should consider. And then I also think from an AI perspective, we'll perhaps see more in sort of self-learning and building uh, propensities using those broader data sets that, that they're assembling. I don't know when it's going to occur. I don't know what the limits are, but you know, I think I, I was actually reading your article and thinking about where that would fit um, earlier this week. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. There, there's so many dynamics, and and as we know, by the time the podcast uh, gets published, we could have changes that we weren't expecting. Right. Um, you know, one thing that's important, and, and I'm going to make a, a plug for you guys here, is that for anybody listening to this podcast, you probably have some interest in your credit card customer base. We didn't come close to covering all the issues that are out there today or all the opportunities that are out there. So I strongly suggest that you also listen to Josh and Craig, who host a podcast of their own called Extra Credit, um, the TransUnion's Extra, Extra Credit Podcast. And you know you can find it on their website, and it's easy to access. Also, on our episode description for this episode, you'll see a link to their podcast. And I strongly suggest, in order to keep on top of what's going on in the marketplace, that you're listening to Josh and Craig's podcast because it's a great way for you to self-learn what's going on because it's firstly impossible to keep on top of everything. But if you're interested in what's going on in the credit card world, what's going on in the credit bureau world, what's going on in the data and insight world as it relates to credit, I strongly suggest you listen to their podcast. I thank you both for being on the show today also. Thank you, Jim. Thanks for the plug too. Thank you, Jim. It's been great. Thanks for listening to Banking Transform, the winner of three international awards for podcast excellence. If you enjoyed today's interview, please give our show a five-star rating on your favorite podcast app. Also, be sure to catch our recent articles on the financial brand and check out our research on the digital banking report. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcast. A special thank you to our senior producer, Leah Haslidge, audio engineer, Sean Earl Hoffman, and video producer, Will Pritz. I'm your host, Jim Roos. Until next time, remember, you need to leverage the partners that are out there willing to help you in order to move ahead.